This Talking Flutes podcast is kindly sponsored by Trevor James Flutes, making life sound beautiful. You can show them some flute love by following them on Instagram at TJ Flutes, Trevor James Flutes on Facebook, and at trevorjamesflutes.com. Hello, this is Talking Flutes. I'm Claire Southworth. My guest today is a fabulous flutist, an international performer and teacher, a champion of contemporary flute playing and new music, and who at an early age left her native America to study in France and never left. She is an American in Paris, and I'm so happy that she's chatting to me today via Zoom, of course. Hello, Patricia Nagel. Hello, Claire. It's so nice to hear you, and I'm very, very thrilled to, to speak with you today because I remember you when you were taking concours and winning them internationally in the United States. And I've always, always uh, loved your playing, and I love the way that you um, participated in the concours and how great you were in winning it. At the National Flute Association, you won first prize. I think Bravo. I a long time ago. <laughs> yes, but it still, uh, you know, stays in my memory. It was a great oh, time. Thank you. How, that's lovely to hear. I didn't realize you were there at the time. Yes, yes. You were yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. We Thank you very, very much. Now, we have so much to talk about because your career is absolutely fascinating. Now, I called you an American in Paris. How did that come about? Well, I don't know. I think they were stemming from a little bit of roots from my teachers in Boston, who were students at the time of George Laurent, or students of students, because that was a very long time ago. And there was a French school, of course, Tafanelli Gobert and French playing. And uh, these uh, great students coming to America at the time, Georges Barrère to New York, and George Laurent to, uh, to Boston, if I get that, those, uh, <laughs> those first names correct. But in any case, um, so we're in amazement, the French school, the French sound. Let's see what's going on. And then uh, you have uh, people coming in, giving, con you know, giving concertos like Jean-Pierre Rampal, uh, or meeting up with um, them at the shop, the Hain shop or, or something like that. And... Um, we're in awe and we're learning French pieces and it seems to be, Boston seems to be very French. The orchestra is very French. And since Americans are so uh, keen on getting an orchestral job at the time, things have branched out uh, since then, uh, luckily and fortunately. But um, so uh, the French sound, what is this? And I must say that um, at one time I had a wonderful teacher coming from Juilliard, a young very young man, his name was Norman D. And he, he told us in the class that if you go to the Nice Academy during this, the, the summer, uh, of course there's Rampal teaching, there is Maxence Larieur and Alain Marion, and there was André Chadorian, etc. He said, if you go there for six weeks, it's as if you had progressed two years at the conservatory. So that was that was maybe my first experience in France. Wow. So I guess it, it came a little bit, um, little by little. Yeah, so you were sort of introduced to the French flute sound and school really in, in, the, in America. And then you came over to France and experienced it for yourself. I must tell you a story actually about the Nice uh, summer school, because I remember I was at a, a summer school in, in England here with William Bennett. And a friend and I wanted to go to see Rampal in Nice. And we'd, we, we thought we'd applied and we got our, our train tickets and we traveled all the way to Nice. And we, the first night we were in a campsite where we were, it was so wet, the mud was up to our knees. But we thought, never mind. tomorrow we go and see Rampal. So we got to the course, only to be told he'd left the day before. <laughs> so, <Wow. laughs> so a little bit of a disaster. So I, 
And then we never <laughs> obviously never got back. So it was, I knew from what people told me, it was a wonderful, wonderful course to go to and a beautiful place. It was, yeah, it was excellent. There were international you know, students and um, a lot of Americans. And it was kind of funny because uh, he was really coming from his um, academic year and from touring. So he wasn't too much in shape. He was having a good time and he was giving advice. But I think what made the classes were the people in it. You know, you're having very fine flutists. There were, I remember I was in class with um, Ransom Wilson. Yes, and he ended up being a little bit his assistant in a way because he was a very good flutist and, and uh, Ram Pal took him under his wing. And I think he was studying with him in Paris, maybe at that time. But um, it was quite amazing. And especially I was introduced to the first three weeks was with uh, Maxence Larrière. Mm -hmm. So everybody's all excited, people from New York, uh, you know, very good flutist. And so he comes into the class and the first student plays and she's quite well known. Her name is Deborah Krasansky. Mm -hmm. And she went to the Paris Conservatory and afterwards, I think she's in Rome. She's first flute. She was principal flute in some orchestra in Rome. So, um, so she was playing uh, Image of Bozza. So she comes in and she's a very, very fine player. Then Maxence takes out, you know, his flute and he plays and it is just amazing. It is just phenomenal. The sound, the connection between the notes, the resonance, uh, the color, the technique. And he was very charming the way he spoke. And it was it's just, I think everybody, you know, like when you drop your jaw in R, <laughs> I, if I can pronounce that correctly for your know, English uh, audience, but it was quite, your, your heart is taken by this type of playing and you say, Mate, I've never heard anything like that in my life. Yeah. Then after the three weeks, I think it was three weeks, it was a long time, there were three weeks with Rampal. And so um, I remember, uh, auditioning uh, in front of everybody, a hundred people, and he'd take the best. And the second best would go to uh, the class of Marion, the less uh, experimented, you know, flip players. Uh, but everybody, all classes were open. So I was in Rampal's class, I was very happy. And um, Maxence Larrière, he had a one reproche. Well, I guess he, it's something he didn't like about my playing. I, I played too fast. <laughs> and it was very, very funny because you know, uh, working uh, on uh, the sonatine of Dutier with him, I would go so fast. And every time he'd look at his watch, he said, he said, are you in a hurry? You know, why? You know, <laughs> you're going so fast. It was very funny. So it, it was quite amazing. It was, it's great. And for Nice, I mean, for an American coming from Boston, to have that touch of, um, you, you get down to the Côte d'Azur, you see palm trees, you know, and, and you can have, ice cream, just as you get outside the station. I remember with um, waffles with strawberries and a lot of whipped cream, that was very impressionable. I don't think I had them, but I, I looked at them. They looked so delicious. And the French people, they were so nice. They were so helpful. Um, everybody was just amazing. And you, you're in a different world from America where people are a little bit more cold in a way, at, at least in Boston. Yeah. Even though they're very nice, of course. But uh, it was I was just amazed. And of course, you had the Riviera, you have Nice, the beaches. And that's quite amazing because, I mean, it's, you want to practice six hours a day in your practice room. But the Mediterranean is calling you when it's getting very warm. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was a struggle to go to classes and also try to, you know, have some fun going swimming and, you know, and being with the other flutist as well. It was yeah. great. It was a great experience. Oh, it sounds it. And it's lovely to have that connection to those, those players, this wonderful French flute school. I mean, I, I did some co a couple of courses with Moise, um, and then I did courses with William Bennett. So that also was the, the French flute school coming through. And it's, yes. I feel it's very yes. important not to lose sight of that. Now, I wanted to ask you something, because in those days... It used to be very easy to distinguish where someone came from when they played, because there were very distinctive schools of playing. 
um, of which the French flute school was was one very distinct school, um, and and arguably the best the best school. That's what certainly I'm sure you and I both agree on that. But how about <laughs> how about yeah. now? Do you find there's still distinction between the different countries, or do you think it's sort of sort of blended into each other? Well, I think with all the masterclasses and all the information, the connaissance going around on YouTube, uh, I think that it, it's becoming more international. Uh, but there's a grain of the French food school probably going everywhere. You have the Russian school, very different, completely different. You have, um, even, even now today, it's a I different agree. way of blowing, different way of sounding. Um, also, there was one very great German uh, player at the in the class, um, Sophie Cherrier, doing a, a Erasmus here. Yeah. And she was playing something beautifully, beautifully well, very difficult. I think it was the Oriente a Weber. Like, you know, okay. She was playing, you know, theme and variations. And I had cool out of cool out. And she, she was amazing. But there was something a little bit unfrench about her, yeah. even though she was, she was just, just there for that year. And of course, you have a lot of Japanese, Korean, and Chinese coming into the conservatory systems. And they sound a little bit, but um, a little bit different. They do, even though a lot of them, some of them sound very French. And then, of course, you have the Galway people. I mean, Galway was in the Paris Conservatory, even though he kept a strong per English personality, but with Moyes and his training, um, quite quite amazing. And he branched to something. He branched out to something that was, you know, really the Galway sound, the Galway technique. Uh, but it was influenced by France a little bit, I must say. Then you have... Um, People like Pa U, who was, uh, you know, studying in Paris Conservatory uh, with my teacher de Beauce, and later he, I think he was with um, Alain Marion. And of course, he went to see um, Nicolet in Switzerland. And he is French school. He was really French school, but uh, an amazing um, performer and who has become very, really international. And I think that the French school has become more international. You go to the United States. I, I was on jury at the NFA Young Artist <laughs> um, a few times and in the finals. And you have a lot of talented people, a lot of talented people. There are a lot of Americans, of course, you know, taking part in this. Um, and what I heard was quite amazing. I, have, I heard like American style of playing. That just lacked a little bit of, as they say, pizzazz, a little bit of timbre, a little bit of sparkle uh, that kind of like kept them from getting the first prize. And th that can happen. That can happen also for international competitions, international concours. I think the French training is probably the best because most of the jury has been to the French school yeah. and they know what they're looking for. They know what they want, the, everything. We can say that the French school has branched out all over the world, but there are still differences. If I can get back to the, you know, your answer. Yeah. <laughs> it's a interesting. little bit. Interesting the people you mentioned and, and a lot of people, of the, the really good players who've come through um, the, the French system or the French, not necessarily training in France, but learning with people who've come through the French system is that they have they still have an individuality and they still have something that's unique to them but they have a lot of care in terms of sound and the line and and the emotion and it's it sort of speaks to me more so than other sort of other schools if you like and so I, I think it's what the French flute school has done uh, exactly. And it's it's really bringing us towards more of a perfection and in interpreting uh, certain works, especially all our 19th century works. Uh, when we come to the 20th century, well, we have, you know, early 20th century um, French works on art. But as we get up to our, our time now, uh, we have different interpretations and sometimes we can find from other schools that it works. It works very well in 
you know, it, I think it's great that people keep their own personalities. It makes them what, what they are. And, and you must, because we cannot copy everybody. We have to be our own true self. Mm -hmm. But we are very much influenced by this uh, search of perfection. And the sound, as you mentioned, the line, but also in the practice techniques, would, not practice techniques, but in the way that we do a piece, like if you're playing Foray, or if you're playing Agresti de Bozza, in there's a, there's a way that we are taught, which kind of is hand down from us, from other teachers. And, and when we are teachers ourselves, we bring this to young students. But these are the things that really work. And it's good to know about them. Mm. Uh, as far as personality of uh, playing a little bit different, I think it comes from the function of how we produce the sound and our concept of blowing. Mm -hmm. And uh, what are we using to make a good sound? Are we using our body resonances? Are we using more support, uh, faster air, less air, um, open, um, open sound or smaller sound, <laughs> um, more timbre, timbre or a, a clunky round sound, which can sound maybe nice for some, some works like garak, Mm -hmm. but maybe not as refined for Gobert or Forêt or, or even Chandelinos. There's, a, there's so many beautiful um, themes uh, c coming you know, in there for us during the slower movements. If we have some type of um, idea about the color, but what is the most important thing, I think, when we play the flute is that when we have a good sound, we should also look for the harmonics inside, within the sound, because some people tend to, uh, either by covering or by closing their lips too much or not hearing, they'll miss that shimmering light of um, color that we have. And, it, you know, when we change notes, sometimes it might change a little bit the the, the homo homogeneity of, the, of, of our general sound. And that's what we have to really be careful for flutists. That I was listening to yesterday to a rehearsal and sometimes we get a fantastic you know, sound, but then we might go up a little bit on the tessiture and we'll just miss that shimmering effect because of what we don't hear, or what we don't do. <laughs> I can go on like this because I think it's quite amazing, the flute. It's, it's such a great instrument. It is. And, and you know, I was going to talk to you about the, the, the sound pro is probably the key to, the, to what we think of as, as the French school. And obviously you, you've thought long and hard about it. And it's, it's something that you bring into your, your teaching and you, you make your students very well. And it's... Uh, for me, I, I also think it's one of the most important factors in successful flute playing. There are a big generalisation here. There are a lot of young players now who, who play very loud and very fast, but without too much thought about shaping and colouring and the emotion behind what it is they're doing. And so people like you keep, keep this, this school of thought alive and then we pass it on to our students, which is which is so important. So, did you did you uh, hear Moise? Did you play to Moise? No, I regret. I I was supposed to go there. Maxence Larrier, he said, "No, you're going to leave Paris. You're going to go to Sion. You're going to go to the school. There'll be Moise." And I just never did that because I was. I don't know what happened. I was. I really didn't want to leave Paris. <laughs> I guess, but also. I was very lucky in the beginning of my career while I was studying. I would um, do what, what would you say replacements in orchestras, and they asked me to play, to play in um, an orchestra in the south of France, which was quite quite a great orchestra. Even at that time, it was the uh, Orchestre National du Capitole de Toulouse, with great great you know. Uh, fantastic musicians, a great um, conductor. His name is Michel Plasson, who did an awful lot for French music. So I was really, I was very busy and you know, I, wish, I wish I had played for Moïse, but I guess sometimes he was not so nice, even to my teacher, <laughs> Michel de Vos. <laughs> <laughs> did you play for him? I did, did. You play for I him? did. 
And um, I, I might have told the story before on here, but I was, I remember playing um, Gobert, uh, Nocturnal Allegro Scherzando. But in those courses, this is in, um, oh, in, um, in Swi- the Switzerland courses. And um, yes. there was no pianist. You just played in front of, you know, hundreds of flute players. Mm-hmm. And I played the nocturne, <laughs> and he said, again. I thought, oh. <laughs> okay, so I played it again. And then he went, again. And I played it through three times. And then he said again, and I looked at him, because I was looking at the front row saying, what am I doing wrong? And everyone was shaking their heads. They didn't know, they didn't know. And he said, um, you make the same mistake each time. I said, oh, okay. He said, and he, it was one little dotted rhythm I made too musical before the uh, semiquavers. You know, sort of about a third of the way down the front page. And he wanted it more dotted. And I thought, I was so cross because I thought, why didn't he just say that rather than make me play it three times? And he said, are you angry? And I said, no, but I I actually was. He said, good, let's continue. So we went on to the Allegro. (laughs) So he he was very, there's an English word, pernickety. He would like to sort of pick and Mm. and push you. He would push you a bit. But then another time I played Air Valak, the Doppler Air Valak. Yes. And, And he was, he was incredible. He, he just, spoke in terms of, of, of images and colour and talked about Tafnell being God in heaven <laughs> and <laughs> in the slow movements, you know, you need to sing to God, a Tafnell in heaven and all these things. And he brought the whole piece to life and he was in a very good mood. So he had, he, this was when he was so, so old, he, he didn't stand. So, you know, he was, he was old and he got very tired and sometimes he was a bit grumpy, but mm-hmm. Mate, still amazing. Now, let's talk a little bit about... That was a great experience for you, by the way. Yeah, absolutely. It made you very strong. Terrifying and amazing all at the same time. Yeah. (laughs) Let's talk a bit about your... Well, let's go back a bit because you went to study then in in France after your niece experience, did you? Yes, yes. I was supposed to... I had just finished um, my... my, What do you... you know, my bachelor's degree in performance. And I was supposed to go for a master's degree at New England Conservatory. I was I was accepted into the class of James Papazakis. And, but it was my second summer in France. And I just didn't want to go back to the United States. I really wanted to stay in France because I thought that I would learn much more there mm-hmm. than I would in the New England Conservatory, which is probably not true. But, very um, brave. I, a very yeah, brave so, decision. Yeah, it was, it was kind of um, very strange. Nobody understood. But since my first summer there in Nice, my, the, I used to dream every night of going back to France. I thought I would never get back there again. I loved it so much. So, you know, here I was in France. And um, what happened is that I stayed. I stayed. So I, I asked um, Maxence if I, be, I could become his, um, his student. He said yes and all that. And he was, he was helpful. And, um, but after a while, I didn't understand anything. I didn't understand what he was you know, teaching me. Because of the language or uh, something because else? Because of the language. And his, his teaching was very different. Um, you know, he would go, I'd go to his house and he'd play his recordings and and then he would play his um, different head joints, and I'd have to tell him which one was sounded better. <laughs> so I was, kind of, I was getting a little bit bored. And um, then I was very fortunate uh, to find a flute friend in Paris who was American, and she was studying with Michel de Bost. And I thought maybe I would understand a little bit better with Michel de Bost since he, his mother was American, he spoke English. And he was a different type of person. He was very open. He was very warm. And he was very just. And he really um, taught very, very well. Very, very well. So I changed teachers. And uh, it was really, uh, you know, I was the happiest in the world because I learned so much from this teacher. 
and he was a he was a great uh, man of the flute, and he had the most beautiful sound, a gorgeous sound too. You know, different from accents, but um, but we could really get into the details of you know performing and playing, which I I couldn't find with accents probably because of the language, but um, so that was very very happy experience really for me it was like. I thank um, my lucky uh, pebbles, or <laughs> I thank the skies, <laughs> our, flute, yeah, our flute gods up there in the sky that, you know, I discovered this great teacher. And, of course, he wrote a lot of books, uh, yeah. maybe not other books. He wrote a simple flute, yes. which is great because it brings every, everything back to order instead of going very complicated about uh, what one should do here, what one should do there. And young people get very confused. The, uh, what can I say is that um, he really put me on the road to be becoming professional. Yeah. Whereas with Maxence, maybe I felt more like a student, a little bit frustrated, not knowing, you know, what, what's going on. And of course, uh, when you become professional, it's because you go out there and play. He threw me inside an orchestra to, to replace and, you just have to fend for yourself. And that's the greatest lesson that anybody can have for, for oneself. Yes. I mean, you're afraid, this and that. You don't know the people and you're under enormous amount of stress because you have to play. Yes, a lot of pressure. It's being broadcasted or maybe on television. So th this is a great school. <laughs> and so after that, did you then... You stayed in France from that moment on. Yes, yes. And I always thought, well, I'll go back someday to America. Because I think it's a little bit easier when you have your family or you have maybe your, your former school, you know, more people, this and that. Because, you know, in France, you, you still are a foreigner. Even though you have good friends or a good teacher, you still feel, you know, you don't have your family, you don't have your roots, as you know, as I can say. So, yeah, I thought maybe I'll go back. But when I had a chance to go back, I got cold feet. I really didn't want to leave. <laughs> very strange. I think uh, Europe is a very important, very important experience. I remember uh, a very, very famous uh, musician in the United States who said that if you want to make it in the United States, you have to go to Europe. Mm -hmm. You must go there because you learn the styles, you must learn this and that. There is so much to offer here that you don't find in the United States at the time. Mm -hmm. So um, I was very happy to come here and I think it's much more uh, fulfilling and it's uh, more rich in culture mm -hmm. uh, compared to what you find in the United States. You have beautiful museums here. You, I mean, of course, you have the Met. In New York, you have also museums. But you have the great artwork here and also architecture. Uh, things are going on here, even though it's the old Europe. Yeah, it's, it's the culture aspect, which is, you know, historically, we have a lot more happening here. So that was... Uh, a very brave decision, a very um, successful decision because you've just flourished since, you, since you've been there. So about today then, you're teaching at the Ecole Normale. So yes. is, is that sort of what we call university level, conservatoire level? So that's from the age of maybe 18 or so? How does it work? Well, uh, l'Ecole Normale is a very famous school, especially for people outside of you know, France. It's a private school and it's been around for a long, long time since Alfred Cotto. Um, we just had our 100th year, um, anniversary. Yes. Oh. Just, just before COVID. So uh, what, what can I say? It's, it's a great school. It's a great, it's a beautiful mansion of beautiful rooms and a great, you know, the hall is Sal Cotto. Um, I've seen the photographs. It's not yeah, It's beautiful. <laughs> As I often see on on um, your 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 posts on Facebook and the photographs, it looks absolutely wonderful. It's very inspiring. So, what can I say? It's very different from the Paris Conservatory system. Completely different. Um, it's it's a bit more expensive, of course. It's it's. I mean, you can have you can get your masters here at the Lycée Normale for under five thousand euros a year for tuition and all the schooling. Um, 
the Paris Conservatory is only 500 euros. Wow. Because the state pays for you. The okay. state pays for you. Yes. And, but it's very difficult to get inside the Paris Conservatory. There's an age limit at 21. And there are many, many people auditioning. And it's, it's very difficult. At Les Condomales, anybody can go. You just go and you audition. But you're put in a certain level. Okay. It's difficult to get your diploma, maybe, but you can. Anybody can come and get the training. the The concours to get out, you know, to get your diploma from the Col de Mal is very difficult. There's an international jury. They come from all over Europe and the United States sometimes, and um, you really have to be up to the highest level, as if you were in the Paris Conservatory. Mm -hmm. The thing is, is that we have so a lot of French people, of course, they know. Uh, this the what's going on here you have the conservatory of region national conservatory of region and then you have the conservatory of the department and you have great teachers there too uh, it's less expensive very good training but it's not the highest diploma mm. the highest diploma of course is at the paris conservatory or in the pole they're called pole superior uh, you have one just next to paris um uh, in Boulogne, Aubervilliers, and then you have outside in Dijon, then you have in the South Marseille, you have also in Lyon, I think, because you have a second superior um, conservatory in Lyon, where uh, Julien Baudion, Baudimont is professor, a great, great wow. Judaist and yeah. teacher. And in Paris, we have Sophie Cherrier and um, uh, Philippe Bernold, who, who were Raymond, the teachers of uh, Julien. So it's kind of like the same family, and they're all, you know, uh, very good friends, and it's wonderful. But um, Les Condemans is a little bit different. There, there are at least nine professors of flute, so there wow. are a lot of flutists. Hey. And sometimes concours go for maybe six days, you know, the, the lesser levels. And each year you get, you get up to, a, you know, a different level, a higher level, and... Then, of course, at the end of your cursus, you have concertiste. And concertiste diploma, in some countries, it's considered as a doctor. Can you imagine? Mm. So it's, it's completely different from the United States, but we really have to get attuned to international diplomas, uh, B BLD, because um, bachelor's, uh, bachelor's or license and then master's and doctorate so that people can find themselves, you know, when they want to get hired, et cetera, you know, to become the professor of a, or whatever. So it's a little bit different. And uh, classes are with great, great, great teachers, great musicians. So I have students coming from Brazil. I have had students from Colombia, from the United States. I have had, um, I have a lot of, you know, Chinese, Korean and Japanese students. French students as well, mm -hmm. Italian students, German students. I mean, the whole, the whole, um, so it's kind of like a melting pot, but it's great. Very cosmopolitan. So tell us, how, how do people um, audition? What are your audition requirements for your school? To get inside the school, yes. you just have to play uh, three pieces, three different pieces, for, uh, three different styles. That, that are different, you know, from a three epochs, periods of music. And then the director will put you in the class he thinks that you will most succeed. So, so there's, no, there's no problem. You would come, you would audition, you would get inside your class and do the curriculum. And mostly it's flute and chamber music and, and then all the others, like, you know, sight reading also on the instrument, analysis, history. So that's that's uh, that's how, how we function at the Condomat. But it's a wonderful school. People are very happy to be there. The students love it. They really do. Yeah. Yes, I, I mean, I've, I've read about it. It sounds wonderful. And you have so many flute teachers. So it just goes to show how, how big a department uh, you have. Yes, yes, uh, yes, they... we have great for teachers there. Yeah. Do, do you have many um, orchestras for them to play in or how does performance? Okay, the go? problem, yes, it's mostly, we have mostly pianists at the school. We have uh, strings. We have a lot of flute. We have clarinets and we don't have all the instruments like we want. We don't have horn yet. Um, we don't have, we did have an oboe, 
but we cannot form an orchestra, but we have a, a sort of a chamber orchestra. Yes. And also we have an orchestra for the conducting because there's a um, conducting school here too. Yeah. So it's not, it's, it's not completely full because the school is not that big. Already there's a traffic jam for, <laughs> for having, you know, um, what do you call it, uh, classrooms. There's yeah. a, lot of, a lot of teachers, a lot of teachers. Yeah. And a lot of teachers give lessons from their home. And then, of course, um, the, the work goes on. What can I say? <laughs> There's quite, um, it sounds like quite an intensive then flute department. Do you, do you give just one-to-one um, -one lessons or do you classes and, or scale classes? Or what do you do? Well, personally, uh, you can do what you want when, you know, everybody can do what they want. I give um, classes where... I don't oblige everybody to come all the time, but they should stay in the class at least for two hours mm -hmm. and listen to other students. Yeah. Classes are all open. And I think all my colleagues, their classes are open to, to anybody who wants to come and listen, to learn. And what I especially do uh, these days, I have a studio class once a month who um, play for, they play for each other uh with the class of accompaniment piano accompaniment so they have somebody to play with them so it gives the pianist a little bit of experience and we have at least two auditions in a in a beautiful room a year and i find cl uh, not classes but i find um concerts outside the school so that the students can really perform for the public and also try to find them places to play here and there when they need a flutist. But mostly they have, they have a curriculum where they have to study a lot. They have to study, uh, as you know, everything that's technical, all the, <laughs> the work on sound, all the work on vibrato, all the work on breathing, all the work on posture. We ha even have a kinesiterapeuta, a physical therapist for musicians so that they don't hurt themselves, so that they have the right posture. And we do classes with her. Coralie Cousin, and even at the Paris Conservatory, they have somebody. Um, also, I entice them to, to find an Alexandre Technique uh, professor, which helps them, you know, it's amazing, because the sound really comes from your body in, in the way you put your body. So, uh, so that's, that's very important. And otherwise, they're, they're working on their repertoire. It seems, it seems like there's not much, but it's a really a lot when you really want to do something. It sounds like you're covering every every aspect, which is what you have to do if you want to be a professional musician. You know, all these all these things need to be covered. But it's it sounds a very sort of holistic place. The fact that there are people looking after how you how you how you stand in terms of anything to do with posture and and your well being. So it's it sounds a very a sort of a healthy environment, is, which is new. Yes. These days. Really, I, I think that it's, it's, um, it's just human to be uh, caring for the other person. And when you have a lot of um, foreigners coming, mm. you know, it's, it's, it's very good to make them feel welcome because already they're very afraid of what's going on. They don't understand everything. Yes. And they don't have their family. Yes, difficult. And do you, do you conduct your classes in French? Oh, I, I anything. <laughs> French and <laughs> And English, because, like for example, I had one great uh, Russian student, but she hadn't learned French at all. So I was giving her lessons in English. And usually, when there are a lot of people, I do French and English at the same time. But yeah. It's very easy, you know. You go back and forth. <laughs> very clever. You know, we've we've talked a lot about then your your early life, getting to to France, and your your teaching. We have a lot more to talk about, about your, your work with all your contemporary music and using the Kingma system. Um, and I think what we'll do is maybe follow on with our second podcast to talk all, about all things performance with you, Patricia. Um, with pleasure. There is there's so much, there is so much to talk about and all the new works you've been, you've contributed to and, and helped to get commissioned. Thank you so much for today. You're welcome, Claire. Well, that was the wonderful Patricia Nagel, and it was such a pleasure to chat to her. Please do tune in for our part two, when we'll discuss her performances, orchestral, solo and chamber music, her flutes, including her Kingmar alto flute, 
and our hopes for this coming year now that our lives are freer without so many restrictions. As always, we love receiving your questions. Please send them to flutepodcasts at gmail.com or comment on our Facebook page, Talking Flutes. Or you can also comment through Twitter and Instagram, at Claire Flute and at Flute. Talking Flutes and Talking Flutes Extra are podcast productions by the Trevor James Flute Company. For more information, visit trevorjamesflutes.com.